A sight and a sound becoming more and more familiar on the broad waters of Britain. Hovercraft, bustling in estuary and strait, short hauls for the smaller ones, sea passages for the big ones, storming into harbour towards beach and hard standing, carrying passengers, ferrying cars, forwarding freight. At the same time, familiarization training for the flying personnel. Necessary, of course, because the N4 was the first ever multiple engine craft of such a size. And this was 001, the first off. Once again, it was the maker's test pilots who carried out the training. doing what in aviation circles would be called circuits and bumps. Learning the controls. Feet controlling rudders and swiveling pylons together with each pair of pylons in opposition to give maximum turning moment. Spectacle wheel putting each pair of pylons in unison to give lateral thrust to induce or control drift. Throttles applying power simultaneously to lift fans and propellers. Thrust controlled by varying the pitch of the propellers. Full throttle, forward pitch, pylons thrusting the craft sideways to port towards the ramp. A little more positive pitch applied by pushing the spectacle wheel forward and the craft moves onto the water. A sortie into the channel to get the feel of the craft with a full simulated load. The N4 is a big craft, 130 feet long and 78 feet wide. It will carry 254 passengers and up to 30 cars. It clearly would need considerably more crew than the N6 in the Solent, which is normally handled by a pilot alone, with a navigator added only in time of poor visibility. There was cabin staff to be interviewed and engaged. For Howard Thorne, route manager Dover, a not unenviable task. Passenger officers, deck officers, and the girls all had to be given a basic knowledge of first aid. These qualifications are demanded by regulation and don't imply that bumps on the head, prostration, and broken limbs are to be a commonplace of travel by hovercraft. All of them, from cabin and flight deck alike, must have some experience of firefighting and using breathing gear. The Navy provided this part of the training on Horse Sea Island, known as HMS Phoenix at Portsmouth. With the thoroughness and good humour for which the men all nice girls love are renowned, they impartially expose them to all the situations they might encounter in dealing with a fire at sea. Some of them are unlikely to be met in hovercraft but a fire started, say, by petrol leaking from a flooded carburetor on the car deck, quickly dealt with, is harmless. Throwing a bucket of water over a fry-up in the galley, if the fat catches, is not. But we don't have galleys in hovercraft yet. Life raft launching drill and evacuation of the full passenger load of the craft in the event of an emergency ditching. Unless it could be done within the maximum time laid down, seven and a half minutes, the Board of Trade and the Air Registration Board 
would not grant the certificates permitting the service to start. The life rafts are larger than those authorized by the Board of Trade in passenger ships which take 25 people. The rafts specially designed for hovercraft will each safely carry 30 people and on an N4 there are 10 rafts, five each side, accommodating all 254 passengers and the whole of the crew as well. Limiting the number of life rafts by this means to 10 permits the limited number of crew to man them adequately. At the final attempt, and literally on the eve of the inauguration ceremony, the evacuation was achieved some two minutes under the specified time. So on the 31st of July, in a helicopter of the Queen's flight, the Princess Margaret, Countess of Snowdon, came, as had long been arranged, to inaugurate the service. The occasion was celebrated by the unveiling of plaques at both Dover and Boulogne and a royal round trip in the craft that was to bear her name. On the following day, the service started as scheduled. Passenger officer who in a ship would be called purser, purserettes who in an airliner would be called hostesses, petty officer in charge of the car deck, car lashers. Pilot, Captain Brenner Lund, now senior captain of the Sea Speed Fleet. Here with first officer and co-pilot, Ian D.L. Fuel for the craft, Fuel for the Voyager, duty-free, of course. Voyagers. There were those who said it was premature. The craft had not been sufficiently proven. Equally, there were others who said that Sea Speed's foresight in gaining experience in the Solent had shown that you can't prove the viability of a service like this without doing it. You've worked out in advance methods for handling hypothetical cars and hypothetical passengers. Now you have to do it under real conditions, with all the human failings and idiosyncrasies that will inevitably occur. Conditions that will be affected by weather and sea states and density of traffic with their interaction on journey times, turnaround times and service frequency. Differences to be assessed in the layout of the landing area provided by French railways and the Boulogne Chamber of Commerce at Le Portel and the different ways of handling car and passenger traffic that these provoke. And above all, the effect on the service of the need to bring the craft in for maintenance. How often and for how long? During the Solent operation, the engineers had found that the skirt was the most vulnerable component of the craft and was responsible for most of the downtime. It was relatively quick and easy to hoist the N6 onto a gantry, duck under and do the necessary make and mend. But the N6 only weighs about six tons. The N4 weighs 20 times as much, a rather different matter. Tucked away in a corner at the back of the landing area at Dover is a cabin controlling a specially designed set of hydraulic jacks. When the necessity arises, the craft must be maneuvered with the greatest precision so that the five feet which support her when she's off the cushion on a hard standing, register with the five jackheads. The commander on the flight deck can't see the guide marks on the ground, so tackles, braille lines and capstans ensure the meticulous positioning. Then, the jacks lift the craft some 10 feet off the ground so that the skirt is hanging free all round.
while other jobs go on up above, the skirt and its fingers, the flexible ducts down which the air is blown, can be serviced. But the frequency with which this was found necessary during that first summer of 1968 showed that the skirt material, and in particular the chain fixings by which the fingers were attached, were not up to the rigors of channel seas and operation. During the winter, the craft went back to the makers at Cowes so that the improved skirt, destined for 1970, could be hastened and fitted for 1969. This done, after an appearance in the Thames at the end of March by way of an introduction to the City of London, the craft set off for Dover to resume scheduled services on the 2nd of April, 1969. Starting services in August 1968 had been fully justified by the experience gained. passage today will take 40 minutes at an average cruising speed of 50 knots. We hope you enjoy the journey. I will now give instructions for wearing life jackets in case of an emergency. Please face your crew member who will demonstrate. In the event of an emergency, you will take your life jacket from under your seat and remove it from the bag. Put it in front of you with a cylinder on the outside. Place the jacket over your head. Undo the tapes. Pass them around the back of the body and secure it. This is a whistle to attract attention, and this is an automatic light. The emergency exit door to the rafts, which are outside the windows, is there. 